Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Prop Proper and this is Devidar number 54 for Victoria 3. Today we will be talking about trade revisions. This one is an important one in the sense that we already talked about trade in the past. We covered trade in AAR videos and I think in a separate video as well. We slowly but surely learned about the rework that had been done with trade that had changed things massively with tariffs of course. Uh, you should check out those videos if you haven't seen them. And it was quite interesting even then because we of course saw Dev Diary 38, the original one that talked about the topic of trade and was a long awaited one, right? But back then there were various concerns and those did keep coming up until we finally learned that they apparently had been reworking trade and tariffs all around. Today we'll finally see all of the details as much as we talked about it in the past and already had more information than you know was actually within the Dev Diary 38. We now actually see the full picture and I'm quite happy but I would like to explore this with you with all of you of course so without further ado let's just jump in and take a look at what has actually been written in this Dev Diary about the new system. As is fairly common knowledge, we are constantly iterating on our systems as systems and even when something has been written about in a dev diary, that doesn't mean that we are 100% happy with it or aren't looking to tweak it in some way. For trade specifically, there were two main issues that were brought up repeatedly from internal testing and feedback but which we hadn't uh, had figured out the solution for yet by the time the trade dev diary was written. These issues were that first, managing the precise level of your trade routes was far too micro-intensive. Remember, you had to manually change the level of the trade route, right? And second, that tariffs didn't function as an effective trade barrier. Indeed, they really didn't. These weren't the only issues, mind you, but they were the two big ones that we needed to design some sort of solution for. Well, design and implement the solution we did, so here I am to tell you all about it. So then, what has changed about trade? Well, first of all, let's go over what hasn't changed. Namely, trade routes are still established by a nation from their market to another market and can be either an import route, which creates buy orders in the foreign market and sell orders in your own market, or an export route, which does the opposite, so essentially creates buy orders within your own market and sell orders in a foreign market. Trade routes also still require convoys to transport goods along sea routes and still create trade centers whose employees manage and profit from those routes. So fundamentally, the logistics are still in. The nature of export and import routes that can either can go either way route uh, is also in. And then the trade centers that actually employ POPs that participate in this trade and benefit from it are also indeed in. Trade routes are created from the trade lens where you will get both a map and list overview of the most suitable markets to trade with. So this is uh, Persia, as you can see, select the market to import wood from. Uh, this would be, for example, from the Russian market and the wood would then go into the Persian market. I like this new map overlay, maybe they are switching it around a bit. This seems like a very much more in the art style of Victoria 3 compared to the little flags with the player symbol that they had in the past, right? I like this much more. It's a coherent theme, it's a coherent pattern, right? Rather than individual flags. Uh, I think when it comes to the... Uh, overlays when it comes to the map overlays, map colors, map, uh, you know, uh, designs that occur when you, for example, are on a certain lens or when you are looking at a war. All of these things, I, I reckon, will be quite hotly debated. Um, no matter what, I think Victoria 3, you know, I, for example, I look at this and I say I like this pattern, this art decor uh, pattern much, much more than I like the old design. People might say, why do we even have this now, right? I like this one, but I gotta tell you, uh, I think uh, <laughs> the question of what a map looks like as we are in different lenses will be something that will stay with this game no matter what. As to what has changed, probably the single most important difference is that you no longer directly manage the level of your trade routes. You can see this here actually as well, right? In this screenshot, you can see... Okay, we can import uh, wood from the Russian uh, from the Persian market. You can see all of these. We can actually only do one level. Uh, why you can do one level, even if the productivity is negative, you're gonna see answered later in this dev diary. But for this one at least, for the uh, for the Russian market, we can do two levels, and it doesn't give you the choice. Do you do one, two, three, whatever? No, no. It just says this is the predicted level of profitability. You can see the Russian market is still productive, whereas the British market, for example, from the very start is indeed unproductive. This would import uh, 50 units of wood, change of course uh, the, you know, you would see the revenue based on the tariffs and then you would see how the markets change or the market prices change in Persia compared to Russia. You can also see that there is a firm cost of bureaucracy in this uh, screenshot, so let's jump in. All newly established trade routes start at level 1 and will grow or shrink on a weekly basis based on market conditions. So if you're playing as Britain and looking to import wood from Brazil, instead of setting the exact level of wood imports that make sense for your needs right away, you simply establish the route and it will grow towards those needs over time if there is space to grow. You see this again right here where the Russian market can give you wood until the second level, whereas the British market fundamentally 
can't really go any further than the first level because it already is unproductive. What that means we're going to see in a second as well. It's also worth noting in this context that we have removed the national limit on the number of trade routes that you can have, which felt crazy gamey, right? And replaced it with a fixed bureaucracy cost per route, which does not increase with route, uh, route level instead, to encourage uh, countries to have fewer, more impactful trade routes. This is really good. I, I obviously, if you think about it on the economy of scale, if I maintain a trade route between two countries and it is a massive trade route, it is much more easy to manage that because we actually have bulk agreements. We know exactly what is going to happen. The stability is much more significant compared to if I source it from 15 different peoples. Their policies could change, their tariffs could change, of course, their actual parliamentary and governmental setup could change. All of these things are uncertain. The bureaucracy that goes into it is always the same. If I have two levels with a Russian market, then it costs me 20. If I have one level with a Macron market, then it also costs me 20. Maintaining a relationship with one steady big partner is always easier. So this is a very natural sort of incentive towards having very few trade routes, but making the ones that you do have matter. Uh, I really like this. Instead of having this firm limit of you can have 20 trade routes, it just says, listen, the profitability here is the question. And then, of course, whether you can maintain it with the bureaucracy cost that comes with it. So, what are the market conditions that affect whether trade routes grow, shrink or stay unchanged? Well, the single most important factor is profitability. We talked about this up here already. You can see it right there with the productivity. A trade route makes money by buying goods that are cheap in the exporting market and selling them at a higher price in the importing market. But it isn't as simple as just looking at the current market price. Instead, each trade route has a purchase price and sale price, which are calculated based on the difference between the pre-trade and post-trade price of the goods in the two markets. So. What does that mean? This means, and, and, and this is, just, just stick with me here, right? This means, and it's going to be explained in a second as well, but you can basically see all of this in this screenshot. I love this screenshot. I love this uh, tooltip because it is so damn informative. What we can see is, this is the pre-price in the Persian market, so where you are exporting to, and this is the post-price in the Persian market. This is the pre-price in the Russian market, and this is the post-price in the Russian market also, if you go up to the predicted level 2, right? What are we talking about here? This means that the average cost that your business has, that your trade center has, for buying the wood is between 18.5 and 20.6. It's the average, whatever that may be. If you uh, add them together, divide them by two, you will know. So they do it in a fairly linear way, right? They, uh, it re In reality, of course, you don't really do it that way. The supply is uh, not actually in a linear distribution, but it doesn't really matter. Don't worry about that too much. But somewhere between 18.5 and 20.6 is the average price that you pay for the goods that you buy on the Russian market. And then on the Persian market, your average sell price is between 23.5 and 20.3, if you add, them, add the two together and divide by two. This is where the profitability comes from. If I buy goods in the British market and the wood is already more expensive than it is in my market, I don't have profitability. The pre-price and the post-price in the British market will be higher, giving me a higher buy average than the actual sell price in Persia, meaning I make a loss. You can still run that, at least for one level we're going to see that, but the entire question of how big can a trade route go is no longer can you click that button, does something change, is there availability? The question now is, is it actually profit? <clears throat> is it actually profitable? For, uh, pardon me, my voice was dying there. And the amazing part about this, what I really like, is that obviously you can make it cheaper. You can subsidize it. You can not just turn to the tariffs, but you can also make it so that, you know, if you, for example, are in a situation where you are exporting something, make that industry cheaper and keep exporting it to make jobs in your own marketplace, both in the actual uh, trade you know, center, but also in the buildings that are producing the exported good. You could literally run a purely export-focused economy where the trade centers, but also maybe more importantly, the actual businesses benefit, whereas they wouldn't have anything to do with these goods in your own market. You know, for example, if you look at, and this is post the time frame, of course, but it did occur. If you look at the cash crops in post-colonial Africa, if you look at the export-focused uh, economies of, for example, the Soviet uh, bloc, you know, when you look at, for example, the German Democratic Republic, Public, they specifically produced goods to export them to get hard currency. But currency isn't a factor here. The idea really is you get this natural distribution of what the pre-sale, the post-sale price is, you make a profit from that, and you can make it cheaper or more expensive with the other tool sets that you have, naturally influencing these trade routes without actually having to plus, plus, plus to go up three levels, right? Really, really like this. Uh, to maintain naval trade routes, you will need convoys. If your supply network is under strain due to a lack of convoys, production or attacks on your shipping lanes, your trade routes will start shrinking over time. So obviously it costs you more money 
Uh, I don't know exactly what the calculation is because they don't say it, but obviously it becomes more expensive to actually maintain a trade route if you know, your coastal or your supply network is actually under strain because then actually chartering a ship would be difficult and so on and so forth. And in reality, or rather in the gameplay, the way it plays out is that it takes a look at the situation and says, yep, this is less profitable now, meaning this trade center makes less money and might have to go back a couple of levels. Even this now, fairly automated. Let's say you're in a position where, for example, your uh, convoys, you know, they're strained and such. Over time, since the profitability now goes down, those trade centers should also actually reduce themselves in size, which then naturally, of course, you know, says, okay, all of a sudden the supply network is in the works again. The interesting thing about this screenshot to me is that this is, from what I remember, the very first time that this uh, is actually shown in this form. I remember the very wild screenshot that we saw ages ago where it was like individually listed who participates in this trade route, where it goes, etc, etc. This is much, much nicer. You can open these, of course, you see on, on one go, you see what actual good these, uh, goods these are. You can see that this, for example, the port connections here, I would assume that these are just the overseas, basically the overseas empire of the British, right? Maybe no trade going on there, but the Chileans are indeed shipping stuff. Uh, away from their capital and into other markets. The Brazilians are doing so as well, as well as the Argentinians. I like this a lot. This looks very nice. And by the way, man, look at the amount of convoys you need to actually run the British Empire. That's insanity. Um, confused yet? To try and explain, I'll use the wood import route to Britain from Brazil as an example. To get the purchase price in the exporting Brazilian market, like I said, the average, we first calculate what the price of wood would be in that market if it had no trade routes exporting or importing fo uh, wood. For example, if it was set only from local supply and demand. Let's make up a number and say that the pre-trade price of wood is in Brazil is 10, quite low. And the post-trade price of wood in Brazil is 20, very average. So 10, 20. Before you buy it's 10, once you have bought, the price has risen because there's more demand now with you buying it and it rises up to 20. To get the purchase price, we simply calculate the midpoint between these two prices, aka 15. That is the assumed price that is your average when you buy this many goods of wood in the Brazilian market. That is the average price per unit that you've paid for it. This means that we assume that our trade route is paying, on average, £15 for each unit of wood they're exporting. The same calculation is then done in the British market to get the sale price, which I'm just going to arbitrarily set at £25. From here, on the math, uh, from here on, the math should be simple enough. Each unit of wood imported to Britain from Brazil generates £10 in profits for the tr uh, trade center. So basically, to calculate the purchase and the sales price, you look at where it is before you export it and then after you export it, and where it is before you import it and after you export it. Then you subtract the two and you see wh uh, whether it's profitable in the case of what we have right here. None of these prices are profitable except in the Russian market. So that is effectively how it works. And that then becomes the profit of the trade center. There's a lot of factors that go into whether a trade route will grow or shrink, but fortunately you don't have to know them all by heart since the level prediction tooltip will break them down for you. Uh, you can see this right here, but this screenshot as a whole is very interesting. Let's just take a quick look at this, right? You see a lot of color coding here. I'm not actually entirely certain. I believe green might always... So this is green and orange, right? It might mean that there's two going. Obviously, uh, the way I see this is that green probably means you maintain this trade route. And orange probably means an external has initiated and maintains this train route, the, uh, trade route. That is how I see it. Because if you look at this, for example, the luxury furniture, it specifically doesn't say French route, right? It, it just says that for furniture, for wine, and so on. Meaning that, yeah, probably, the, the way it works, green probably means that, uh, indeed, we're talking about a trade route that you are running yourself. Quite interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing here is, of course, that we can already see something that is mentioned later on in this actual dev diary, and that is the question of, okay, what are these buttons? These are buttons for your tariff focus. We're going to take a look at that in a, a second. This is unfocused, this is, I believe, import focused, and this is export focused. And this way, on a macro level, you can determine whether you want to incentivize exporting or importing, whether you want to protect your own industry, whether you simply, whether it's imported or exported, want to go ahead and tax it, right? That is always something that is beneficial for you as well, just taxing it. This would be the undirected right there. Anyway, down here we have the actual tooltip that they just talked about. Um, you can see it right here as well. Predicted price impact on wine in the Russian market goes from 87.5 to 39. And then predicted impact in the French market goes from 45.8 to 63.1. And the reality here is that you might look at this and say, wait a minute, but how can the end price in the French market be higher than in the Russian market? Because what we're doing here, of course, is we are exporting wine from France. So the price in France goes up and the price in 
uh, Russia goes down. The reality of this is that when you, the last unit, right, isn't assumed to be bought at 63.1 and sold for 39, that would be nonsensical. The last unit is assumed on the average price, right? That, that is where this comes from. So, uh, what is this, 50... 53 I want to say right this is the last unit where it was purchased and this is I'm pretty sure also like somewhere at 53 basically this is the equilibrium any more units would raise the average purchase price above the average sales price meaning that this level that this trade route level shouldn't go any higher any lower and you're leaving profit on the table any higher and all of a sudden you're making a loss by exporting which why would you do that right so this is the assumption the prices here indeed overlap at the end of the day uh, wine becomes more expensive on the french market than on the russian market but the reason for this is indeed that the average price per unit is now roughly in the equilibrium even though of course the actual price per unit that you now freshly would buy would be higher in the french market compared to the russian market uh, i really really like this i i think it's a great implementation when it comes to how it does it automatically and how I can influence it of course with tariffs with subsidies with incentives and so on and so forth with trade deals for example however I'm looking at a situation where I don't have to min max where I don't have to micromanage anything whatsoever that is done naturally it means that for example trade centers that certain regions that heavily rely on trade let's say there's an obvious for example port in whatever nation you are in that is used as the main or maybe even the loan port that is for all of your trade right that port would live and die with your trade relationships with the world you could actually have a dependency now that basically was created without you in directly trying to do it because it was just in a situation where it was just beneficial to trade right from there and if tomorrow the trade moves somewhere else or if tomorrow the trade breaks down you will have a bunch of very angry pops because all of a sudden of course they will earn less their standard of living goes down and so on and uh, let's take a look at this by the way required comma is 2111 i believe that we are the french indeed or are we the british i, I believe we're the french either way a uh, really cool implementation you just need to understand it goes basically by the average price per unit and then naturally go up there so what you need to do is you need to make it more expensive or cheaper to then influence how much is actually exported and imported anyway well it would be that simple if it weren't for tariffs so now tariffs come into play tariffs are collected on both ends of the trade route with the exporting market collecting export tariffs and the importing market collecting import tariffs under the new system, tariffs can be a highly effective trade barrier because they are calculated against the base price of the good rather than the market price. This means even if you buy goods somewhere that are cheap, you will be pr uh, paying the base price or rather a tariff on the base price. So 20, 30 percent, whatever of the base price rather than of the very cheap price where you just bought it from. This makes it so that the cost indeed will always be rather significant if there is a tariff. What this means is that if the import tariff on wood is 25%, that import tariff is always going to be £5 rather than sometimes £2, sometimes £12, right? If you have a degree in economics or you're just surprisingly good at following along with my overcomplicated explanations, you may already have picked up on the reason that setting against the base price makes tariffs a more effective trade barrier, namely that it disproportionately affects high volume, low revenue per unit routes. Our example, wood route above a tariff of £5 means a full 50% reduction in profits. And as the route grows and the difference between the purchase and sale price shrinks, tariffs will take away more and more of that profit until it's simply more profitable for the pops in the trade center to stop growing the trade route level and indeed may end up reducing the level in order to make more money for themselves. Why import more if you're selling it for a loss if you consider tariffs? This is the big question and that is exactly how it works in real life. Nobody exports or imports with a country where they of course you know pay more money in the actual transaction if you consider tariffs than if you didn't do any action at all. It's opportunity cost and I think it comes in in the nicest way here. I gotta tell you I really really enjoy this. Um, I'm not sure uh, and I gotta tell you I just I'm, I'm not an expert on it. I'm pretty sure that like it's not actually based. Uh, honestly it's, it's obviously based on like what it would regularly be sold at or bought at in the regular market if you really do in real life import export something and depending on the tariffs of course that come with it but it just makes me think i think this solution on the mechanical level makes so much sense it doesn't really matter whether the country just says oh this is how much we i mean sometimes actually they probably surely they, they have a flat tariff on goods it's very I, I guess it's very flexible in real life it's, it's a very complex topic but this implementation in its simplicity and it's not really simple, as you may notice, if you're still confused by everything in this dev diary, but in its simplicity, this solution creates a mechanical uh, impact where you changing your tariff laws, but also your tariff policies, 
is insanely impactful no matter where and when the trade route runs you can impact whether you can export or import more or less in so many different ways and it will genuinely be meaningful both in your nation and in the nation that you're trading with i'm a big big fan of of this approach it really does make tariffs very meaningful and you're going to see this even further when we check on how these goods actually work in terms of or rather these tariff policies actually work in terms of implementation it's worth noting that trade routes can never shrink below level 1 and so will always trade a number of goods even if doing so at a loss. So that for instance you can always import a small quantity of weapons or ships needed to kickstart your military or merchant marine, assuming that you're willing to subsidize the trade center if it doesn't have other more profitable routes to make up for the losses. So just to clarify this as well, trade centers run multiple routes if that is where the route starts. So you have the state of, for example, Normandy, that trade center can run 50 million routes if you have the manpower and so on. Um, and those will be run in that trade center, meaning a route can be deeply, deeply unprofitable if it means that at the very least you can counter it out either by subsidies or by other trade routes. That's pretty neat as well because it's not just, of course, one trade center, you know, one big trade industry, I should say, doesn't just trade one good. No, if you look at Amsterdam, if you look at Rotterdam, if you look at Hamburg, those ports trade a lot more than just one type of good or one recipient. So then, is creating trade routes and letting them do their own thing the only way you interact with trade now? Well, no. Since we've taken away the need to adjust routes manually, this means that we can now put emphasis on other, more indirect ways to uh, manipulate the flow of goods between markets. These include strengthening trade agreements, which now remove both bureaucracy costs and tariffs from all trade routes between the two countries. That is amazing. I mean, that is just really, really good. Removing every single tariff. It's, it's very intense. Obviously, there's a lot going on there because it could mean that somebody can directly act against you on certain things. I wish you could maybe granularize that, uh, that but I think it wouldn't be relevant outside of uh, 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 multiplayer, you know, which might don't don't uh, definitely don't undersell that but what i'm saying is fundamentally in this time frame doing a trade route or rather a trade agreement with somebody is a very incredible step right it opens up markets to an incredible degree and in this sense they have decided to basically say a trade agreement will void every single tariff that you would be raising that you would be uh, indeed collecting on a certain on any trade route and i really like this i mean that just makes trade agreements very very impactful seriously you need to consider that both from could this mean my market gets plundered you need to also consider that from does this allow me to plunder them potentially right the impact of a trade agreement really makes you vulnerable but at the same time could create a massive massive uh, increase in standard of living as of course the tariffs fall away and you can much more easily export and import certain things and um, it also has the ability to place embargoes on countries that you want to keep out of your market very very nice uh, i'm a big big fan of this as well finally really putting in that uh, that sort of work here i hope that we can respond to this and surely we can, right? Th that's the point of, of trade ports at the end of the day. But if somebody embargoes me, if somebody embargoes everybody, because that is, for example, their trade policy, isolationism, right? I would like it if we definitely just have a response. But honestly, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have a response. This should directly correspond to the question of, uh, you know, how are you doing in terms of uh, the isolationist trade policy? Can you get involved there? Can you get a trade port? And so on and so forth. But that is a diplomatic crisis, of course, so that's a, or a diplo play, that's a different topic. Mexico decides that it has had enough of American meddling in their market. It's embargo time. See, here we have this dissonance now, in my opinion. I'm, I don't know what this means. Like, what does this, I can see this, this is the selected country. This, this very pattern here appears to be the selected country pattern, right? Pretty good. You can see it, you recognize, you go, it's a coherent pattern. I like it. I personally like it anyway. What is, what is this? Is this a Roman numeral 2 with a flag? Why would it be a Roman numeral 2 with a flag? Is that Mexico's flag in this period? I I would prefer more of these patterns over these. I, I feel like, um yeah. Or like just put one big symbol into Mexico, right? Whatever this symbol actually is i i don't really know uh, anyway what can we see here of course we can see the diplomatic interactions between mexico and the usa a diplomatic pact this is an embargo established by one country targeting another which completely blocks the target country from importing or exporting goods in the embargoers market countries that are at war will automatically embargo each other you could theoretically literally play the role of the person that undercuts the embargo where, you know, two countries are at war and one country has something the other country really needed for its industry. So they embargo each other automatically because they are, of course, at war. You take that good out of that other person's market, give it to the enemy in that war, and all of a sudden, 
the trades is still facilitated, but you are the one that profits. Now, if that isn't war profiteering, then I don't know what is. And I really like this. The, the implementation here is nice. I hope the AI really uses it, though. If they dislike you enough, you know, they start embargoing you specifically. If they recognize you as an enemy, um, I, I think that would be quite important. And obviously, yeah, the, the question is just how, uh, how willing they are to use that. Whether it's... You, know, you can be overly willing to use something, right? Especially as an AI where it could become annoying. But the implementation here is so much better than the original trade. It's just, it really has to be said. And um, the only thing that I need to point out, and, and that I really do consider, obviously, it considers if you are running out of convoys, right? You're looking at a situation where your trade route will be less profitable, they might shut down some levels. Makes sense. Yep, I understand. It's completely reasonable. Uh, if you have tariffs, this will influence the profitability as well. The only thing that I am missing, but this comes down to the whole convoy system being a global resource. Basically, you for your market have the convoys, and that is just the way it works. Um, there's no really, like, inter-building convoy purchasing activity going on. The convoys are fed into your convoy supply chain, right? Um, I would have really loved it. I would have really loved it if not only are your trade routes and your trade centers negatively impacted by uh, your convoy abilities being not enough, to actually facilitate the trade and the internal supply and such, but that they might actually be calculating the cost of the convoy directly into the trade activity that they're doing. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, if I'm, as the United States of America, importing wood from Russia, for example, I would have loved it if the Trade Center considers the convoy, so if it became a local resource rather than a general resource. Obviously, that is not a, that is not possible. You would have to reform the entire convoy system. But it could also mean, for example, that barracks, you know, they, they need more funds if they utilize convoys directly to supply troops overseas, rather than you just being in a position where you need those convoys now and you're paying for them anyway. Um, I gotta tell you, it would need a complete system rework. It's just one of those things where it's like, I would like to see that. Whether it's better, I can't say. But I like the idea of it. I, I love the sound of it, right? Um, but ultimately, of course, it comes down to you would have to consider so many other angles of logistics there where, again, it's the entire rework, but it's not really strictly necessary because this already works very, very well. It's just a tiny thing where uh, I would like the global value convoy supply chain to become a local value that is actually applied to the individual buildings and such. Would be cool, um, but again, the entire thing would need to be re reworked because you would have to consider over land logistics all of a sudden where, okay, who pays for... Uh, land trade routes, right? If I have a trade center at the border of France between Germany and France, uh, who pays for that? Because that is still transport. That costs a lot of money. People always have to consider that. And uh, overseas trade, of course, you know, became much, much cheaper in, in many, many ways uh, when it comes to the uh, potential that it had. So I would love to see that eventually maybe, but it's one of those things. Obviously, the global resource of the supply network is what works and what this system is embedded in and works marvelously. And that's really the only thing that I can bring up there. And the other interesting thing here is, of course, then the actual market good policies. We already looked at them right here. Couldn't really explain them, right? But let's do that right now. Uh, however, probably the single most important tool that we have added for controlling trade is market good policies. There are three such policies which you can set separately for each individual good in your market. So nice. I really, really like that. If you want, basically, if you want wood from somebody, before we even read further here, if you want wood from somebody, but other people are also importing woods, uh, wood, I mean, you can set your tariff policy to keep those people from actually doing that, right? Because you make it uh, more expensive for them. You turn the tariffs against them and then sign a trade agreement with the nation that you want to interact with here. Would be nice if trade agreements were per good, but again, maybe too uh, small. Uh, to small-minded, I mean. But anyway, you can basically sign a trade agreement there, turn the tariffs against the other people, and all of a sudden, that friendly fella that you have where you sign a trade agreement with can export to you in a crazy amount, whereas the other ones are restricted by the virtue of profitability. Not that, you know, technically, they couldn't just make like, subsidize their trade centers. Man, trade wars are gonna be, with this change, see, this is something that the old system never was able to do. With this change, I can think of a thousand situations where you can still move some levers and make it so that somebody is in a trade war with you. Very exciting. Uh, you could counter-subsidize your own trade centers and then make it so that they can still sell it. You could subsidize your own industries to still undercut the tariffs and undercut the trade uh, agreement partner of the other person. Quite interesting. There, there's a lot going on there that could be done. 
Um, I'm, I'm gonna go to town when it comes to destroying the economy for no reason whatsoever when actually playing that game. Now let's talk about the trade policies though. How can you set them? What do they mean? Protect the domestic supply. This market good policy removes import tariffs and increases export tariffs, encouraging countries to supply more of this good to your market and discourages them from exporting it away from you, which might be useful if you, for instance, want to keep the price of clippers low so that you'll pay less to maintain your ports. Then encourage exports. As the name uh, pretty much ex uh, explicitly states, this market good policy removes export tariffs and increases import tariffs, which is highly useful to, uh, if you, for instance, want to drive up the price of furniture so that your furniture industries will see increased profits. Makes a lot of sense, right? If you want to export this, uh, you make it easier to export it, all of a sudden you look at these, uh, at these goods and they become much more expensive and the money goes into the pockets of the right people. It's a big topic in Victoria 3, of course, that the money isn't just made, but that it's made for the right people. And this is exactly what that is. This is the default market good policy, this is no priority, which sets both import and export, tar uh, export tariffs at the baseline determined by your trade laws. So again, do remember what those tariffs actually are fundamentally are set in the laws and those need to be changed with your interest groups and so on. Um, the individual policy is then just something you do as you, you know, are actually looking at the market situation in the moment. To give you a couple examples of what this baseline could be, under mercantilism you have overall lower export tariffs and higher import tariffs, while free trade removes all tariffs together. Very, very cool stuff. Very excited for this. I gotta tell you, the trade rework is exactly what I wanted from this. There's the, the one thing about the supply network, again, uh, Luftschloss is what we would call it. It makes no sense in the existing system, so don't worry about it too much. I just wanted to bring it up indeed, because that is, of course, a consideration that you need to do when you export import, when you internally actually manage something. Currently, this is done on a global level, much like infrastructure, where you as the market owners, so to speak, have to take care of it, rather than, for example, individual businesses also paying towards it. Either way, um, the next dev diary is about achievements. And isn't that kind of crazy? I'm just, listen, I'm, I'm just saying. So we know on the 30th, I believe, there will be a live stream of Victoria 3. Some announcement and pre-orders, apparently. I personally, when I heard about the live stream, I was like, I think this means that within six months, uh, six weeks, I want to say, of the live stream, so like we're talking mid-October, the game probably releases. It's, it's just a guess. I want to make this clear as well. But man, they're covering achievements. They're covering achievements, okay? I think... I could see between mid-September to mid-October as my, this is probably the date, okay? It could be later as well, it could be November and such, but I'm more coming from an angle here. Come on, man, you're covering achievements? Really? Come on! That, that, that's like the last thing that you cover. Uh, again, 30th or 31st, I can't quite remember, P uh, Paradox will stream Victoria 3 on the 2nd and 3rd is PDXCon. I'm just saying. I think between mid-September and mid-October is my hottest guess. What is your guess for the Victoria 3 release date? Let me know about that and let me know about what you think about the trade changes. I very much like them, very much enjoy the changes made here. You are much more active now on a macro level and it just makes sense. It fits much more nicely into the rest of the gameplay mechanics, I would say. Either way, I will leave you here and I'll see you later. Alligator.